I grew up in a, a large industrial city in a lower middle class neighborhood and it, it was not very beautiful. Um, uh, there was not much that was decorative in the, in the area. It was uh, not, not many flowers, <laughs> not many, uh, rather plain. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I've always been sensitive to it, my environment. And, and uh, I think that was an early memory I had of how it felt to be in different places. And uh, I've gradually been fortunate enough to live in different places that were more pleasant, more attractive, more, more um, aesthetically comfortable, you might say. Uh, All I can say in response to your question here is that I think I detected a, a certain lack, uh, a certain emptiness that I think mm -hmm. I've been trying to fill with the, my good fortune in living in places that were more beautiful and, mm -hmm. and uh, um, um, more humane. I think, unfortunately, most people are not able to live in environments that are humane. They're, they're industrial environments, they're, they're stone, cold, mm -hmm. polluted, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, a, it's a loss, a loss of, of possibilities. For, for, for uh, being at home in the world, essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, how the music arrived in your life? Music. Uh, I was fortunate enough to go to a, 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 a school. My first school had a good music teacher, mm -hmm. who taught us. Um, exposed us to some wonderful music that made a permanent impression on me. And then we had the possibility to have lessons on instruments, and I took some lessons, and, and I was able to study the piano after. And it was my good fortune to be able to have this opportunity. And it, it's made it had a permanent effect on my life and on my thinking. To some extent, a frustration because it's difficult to play music well. Mm. But a, a reward in the sense that it's, it's a very rich experience to, to participate in music in some way. And one can participate by listening actively and one can participate by playing. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are ways of making life deeper and richer. Mm -hmm. Do you think that music helped you to improve more your sensibility? Yes, yes. Sensibility, as you know, is a, a key idea of mine. And, um, and music is, a, is an art that asks us to listen and to listen carefully and to listen not just to the loudest sounds and not just to the sharpest sounds but to the the uh, the fine changes in sound the the sounds that go underneath the melody mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the the the, the f full texture of the sound and uh, I think that the experience of music helps to develop sensibility. 
the, the richness of sensible perception. Mm-hmm. And how uh, did you go from the music to the philosophy? Well, uh, uh, I studied music at a conservatory uh, eventually, and I graduated and got my de- first degrees there. There, um, but I felt I needed had many questions about life and about art that puzzled me, and I needed to. I wanted to study more, mm-hmm. and. Uh, when I had the opportunity after being discharged from the military service with uh, an opportunity to go back to school, I decided this was an opportunity to study mm-hmm. many things that I was interested in that I hadn't had an opportunity before. Mm-hmm. So I studied uh, mostly philosophy, some psychology, mm-hmm. and uh, I continued to, to do that. Mm-hmm. And uh, how uh, you go to the uh, phenomenology, phenomenology approach? Well, that's oh, got an interesting question too. I was, uh, um, the university that I attended for my graduate, my PhD work, mm-hmm. was um, the University of Buffalo, which became part of the State University of New York. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, I studied philosophy, and the two senior professors in the department were phenomenologists. They, were both, had, they both had been students of Edmund Husserl, the founder of phenomenology. Uh, one was named Marvin Farber, my principal professor, and the other one was Fritz Kaufmann, who uh, taught aesthetics. And I think I just absorbed a way of thinking, absorbed an approach. Certainly, neither, neither, neither of them was an orthodox phenomenologist. Um, but I, I, I uh, realized that the emphasis on perception was very important in dealing with the arts. And and on the, the directness of perception, not mediated through ideas and through uh, th- theories, but, but the directness of experience. Mm-hmm. And phenomenology seemed to offer an approach that respected that directness. Mm-hmm. Could you talk a, uh, about your uh, Aesthetic experience. My personal aesthetic yes. experience. Yes, well, um, it's been wide and varied. Fortunately, um, w- there was a good symphony orchestra in my hometown. Mm-hmm. Very good symphony orchestra, and I went to concerts and learned a lot. Uh, f- had wonderful experiences from from them. Some theater, there was also a very good art museum. Mm -hmm. And I learned, became acquainted with uh, art, including contemporary art. Mm -hmm. And in the course of life, uh, I've had many opportunities to visit museums and Mm -hmm. to travel. And and, uh, the richness of the aesthetic is continually increasing. It, it, one never gets to, gets to the end of of its possibilities, mm-hmm. and so everything is contributes to this experience. Here we here we, we are now in 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 my home in North America, experiencing spring, mm-hmm. and and the aesthetic delights of spring are. Are, they're manifold, they're, they're endless, mm-hmm. and uh, it's a rediscovery every, every spring to, to... It is about self-perception. Well, it's about the perception of en- environmental perception. Mm-hmm. 
but there's no environmental perception without a self, without a person doing it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that uh, that being in this environment has enhanced my my awareness, my aware my awareness, the value of my experience, and my life. Mm -hmm. All the perceptions are aesthetic. Well, there is an aesthetic factor in every perception. Mm -hmm. They're not some some experiences are not primarily aesthetic. Many, maybe most, mm -hmm. for most people, are not primarily aesthetic. But there, but there's an aesthetic factor. Mm -hmm. There's sound. There's uh, visual conditions. There's there's um, the participation of our bodies and what we do. Mm -hmm. There's an aesthetic factor in all experience, but it's in the arts that that factor becomes central, is emphasized, is intensified, mm -hmm. and because it's such an important part of human life, the more it's developed, the richer our life becomes, mm -hmm. in my view. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what is for you engagement art? Because this is a term that you create, engagement mm -hmm. art. E engagement in art, mm -hmm. aesthetic engagement. Aesthetic engagement. Aesthetic engagement. For me, this refers to the experience of a of aesthetic appreciation, and it's an experience of, that requires our intimate involvement in in the situation, whether it be involvement with with music, with with a painting, with uh, with a place, mm -hmm. whatever it is, we are actively participating in it. And that, for me, is, is, is central. Uh, if we don't contribute, then, then it's a dead experience. Then it's just an, uh, uh, then what we are experiencing, what we are looking at or, or dealing with is something that's foreign, that's outside of us, and it, it doesn't have much meaning. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the idea of aesthetic engagement has to be contrasted with aesthetic disinterestedness, mm -hmm. which is the more common way of thinking about aesthetic appreciation. Uh, it, it argues that, that uh, to appreciate something, one has to be, one has to take it for its own, in, it, in its own right, by itself, and, and isolate it, make it something separate. And, and it's true that in appreciating something, one has to focus on, a, on the object or the situation. But that doesn't mean separating yourself from it. It means engaging with it, entering it, c connecting with it. So I think that, that aesthetic disinterestedness impedes the full experience of appreciation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't promote it. Whereas aesthetic engagement builds on that that involvement, that participation, and the, the contribution that is made to the situation by the appreciator, by the object, if it's an object, by the the artist, mm -hmm. and by the. I like to say there's a performative element in all appreciation. The performative element is the activation of the situation. Sometimes there's a, a literal performer who, a performer who plays the music, or who dances, or who acts in a, in a theater. Mm -hmm. But in a sense, everybody appreciating, in appreciating an art, performs the art by being active, um, um, bringing it up, bringing it out, Attending, responding, uh, probing into it. Uh, so there's the, the appreciate, 
the appreciative process is a creative process too. Mm -hmm. And that's what the artist does. Mm -hmm. like, like what the artist does. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, aesthetic engagement is, is the, the best way to express this kind of appreciative participation. And uh, could you talk a little bit about what what changed in your, in your thinking from the uh, first book, Aesthetic Field, and to the last one, the what the name? Is Aesthetics it? Beyond the Arts. Yes, Aesthetics Beyond the Arts. Well, um, when I first started writing, I was writing a more traditional, taking a more traditional approach. I was writing about about the aesthetics of the arts, writing about painting and music and, mm -hmm. and uh, the other arts. And, and that developed from my first book, which is called The Aesthetic Field, to, um, I think it was my third book, Art and Engagement, Art and Engagement. And that was a book about different arts, about painting, about music, about dance, about film, mm -hmm. uh, and in trying to understand how those arts function in our appreciative experience, um, I began to real, I began to become more, I became more and more interested in the environment. And, uh, and I think that came out of my interest in landscape, because and landscape and landscape painting. Mm -hmm. uh, I was struck by looking at cer certain landscape paintings, particularly the Dutch landscapes of the 17th century, mm -hmm. Van Ruisdael and Hobbema. Um, the, they were, they are paintings that are not just scenes that are pretty to look at, they draw you into them there's a road or there's a path that invites you to follow into the painting. And I discovered that, that in looking at those paintings, I wasn't just looking, I was in, in a kind of imaginative way entering them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I more and more became interested in, in environment as an aesthetic situation. And that became the key to my, I guess it was my third book, The Aesthetics of Environment. Mm -hmm. My second book was, was Art and Engagement, then The Aesthetics, they came very close together. And that didn't stop there because then I realized that environment is, is not just a beautiful landscape, it's also the city, which can be beautiful in many ways and can be uh, oppressive and hurtful and, and uh, destructive in many ways. And so uh, I wrote some essays on urban, and urban environment. Um, and I've continued to be interested in that. And then I realized uh, that Oh, well, let me just add that appreciating environment is very instructive because it, because environment cannot properly be objectified. Environment is not out there. Mm -hmm. It's here. It's where we are and we walk and we walk in environment and we move and we are participating parts of, 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 an, of an, an environment. Uh, we are the environment. We are, we are part of the environment. Mm -hmm. We are not the whole environment because we are not everything, mm -hmm. <laughs> but we are part of it. And, and the environment is part of us. So there's no sharp division. Mm -hmm. That led me to other interesting discoveries. It led me to realize that when we are, um, in a social, when we are talking to somebody else, the other person 
as we in our conversation now, the other person is part of our environment. So there is a social element to environment. The social environment is also an environment. Mm -hmm. And that brings in all kinds of other things. It brings in the, the, the range of, of ethical thought. Because human relations are always, there's always an ethical factor in human relations. Human relations, there's a morality. People have written about the morality of art, but it has to do a lot with human relations. And when you focus on human relations, the moral factor is, is, is a central factor. Mm -hmm. But so is the aesthetic, and so you see the two are not separate. Mm -hmm. And then in dealing with human relations, I realized that human relations are not only just only social, but that brings in the political. Because in how we deal with people, political issues are, are involved. So there's an aesthetics of politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me introduce one final factor, which is that in extending environment to include every environment, it includes also our ordinary lives, the, the, the streets we walk on, the, the tables we sit at, the objects that we use. And there's an aesthetic factor in those too. Mm -hmm. The, the um, objects that we use. And, and, and I started writing many years before the present interest in, in everyday aesthetics. I, I started writing about that and calling attention to the aesthetic factor or aesthetic presence in ordinary experience, mm -hmm. in the utensils we use when we eat, in the pots, in the, in the appliances, uh, in the table and the chairs that we sit on. These are all objects that are part of our world and they have an aesthetic, aesthetic uh, presence in that world. Mm -hmm. So my, my world of aesthetics is very big. Yes, I know. <laughs> I know. And uh, one more question is about the negative sublime. Negative sublime. sublime. Well, uh, I began to realize that if everything well, you see how my ideas have developed from my first book. Um, if everything has an aesthetic element, is a, has an aesthetic aspect, it's not just a factor, it's part of the whole situation. Um, I began, and, and, and if the aesthetic is part of everyday life, there is much in everyday life that is that is not positive, that is ugly, that is degrading, that is uh, small and mean, that that diminishes the possibilities of rich experience. And I discovered that uh, if we're talking about the aesthetic, we have to include the whole range of experience, including its neg the negative experience. Mm -hmm. So I began to talk about, write about negative aesthetics. Uh, uh, I know people usually use, the, at least in English, use the word aesthetic to mean something positive. They say, oh, that's, that's aesthetic, that, mean, that means it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. But aesthetic doesn't mean beauty, it means um, perceptual experience, it refers to perceptual experience. And, and the perceptual experience can be ugly, uh, it can be offensive, it can be um, it, can, it can hurt us in ways, there is aesthetic harm. Mm -hmm. So I started writing about that in in my book, Sensi uh, Sensibility and Sense, mm -hmm. uh, about aesthetic harm, aesthetic uh, in injury, and 
the, all the negative aspects of aesthetics. And th there are things in our, in our environment that are like that. Um, bad design. Clothing that, that doesn't make a person look attractive, but makes a person look ugly. Mm -hmm. That brings out the, 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 the poor features of a person rather than the good features of a person. Uh, there's... Um, um, and also in mm, social aesthetic, no? In, also in the social in the social aesthetics, yeah. there are situations that that are hurtful, but they're hurtful because they they make you feel bad, which can be a moral negative moral factor. But they also limit mm -hmm. um, the the positive possibilities of mm -hmm. social relations. Uh, I have an optimistic streak. I think that potentially everything could be could be good. Everything could be rewarding. Everything could be all experience could be fulfilling. All situations could could develop and enhance us. And and we try to live that way much of the time. We educate children to open their world. Mm -hmm. We teach people art appreciation to enlarge their world. Um, mm -hmm. In this way, the aesthetic experience is transformative. It's transformative, absolutely. It can it can change change your world, and I think it does for people. Uh, it can also reveal the world in ways that are not always positive. Mm -hmm. So, but but we we value the, that kind of transformation too. Tragedy in in in, uh, in drama, mm -hmm. um, uh, or f film that depict depicts uh, violence can make us un unhappy, but but make our world richer because we recognize what's going on, what's happening. Mm -hmm. So the aesthetic, I, I think, is the most fundamental factor in in the value. One of the most fundamental factors, fundamental factors in the value of human life, mm -hmm. in, uh, in 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 value. One of the most fundamental values in human life. Mm -hmm. And uh, what would you like to to say to the people that is now? seeing us in this video. What would you like to say to the general people or to the artists or to the students? Uh, well, there's a world of discovery for us to to find in our lives and, and study uh, learning about the arts and learning how to appreciate the arts learning how to appreciate environment, learning how to appreciate people, uh, to appreciate situations. These are all ways of living larger and uh, more fulfilling, in a more fulfilling way. And I hope that, that these remarks will help people realize the importance of the aesthetic and call attention to, to it and, and, and search for f greater and fuller rewards in, in experience, in perceptual experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, teacher. You're welcome. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to talk to you. <laughs>
with other people, togetherness is feeling with other people, and and a, and a, a unity with other people, and that's a moral mm. achievement too. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, so I would think that a, a, a developed aesthetic community would be also a moral community by the very fact of being mm -hmm. sensitive and responsive and. Mm -hmm connected with other people. Mm. Um, it's kind of an ideal, but you may experience it in your groups. Yeah. Why do you think that the aesthetic community can exist, could exist in a, a rational, in the rational community? Well, rational, that's another order of mm. things. That, that's uh, a rational, it has to do with concepts and with organization and I have a colleague uh, who who calls himself an anarchist, mm. and he thinks that uh, that organized society is not good, that the people can voluntarily organize, and ideally, maybe that that in in an ideal social world that would be possible. Then it could be rational and moral and aesthetic uh, but that's uh, unlikely to happen in the world that we live in maybe for how do you see our world in this moment oh as as a, not a moral community is broken up as as a, 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 not community, community at all, but somehow different communities, smaller communities, nationalities, groups struggling against each other, uh, sometimes cooperating, sometimes not, trying to exist together without destroying each other and without destroying the world, the planet. But then I don't think there's much success. Do you see some solution? No. It's aesthetic education.